You're listening to Chesteropod, episode 13, recording on Woo! Tuesday, March 17th, 2020. That is, everybody's locked down in some certain sense, or they're COVID-19 everywhere. So uh, I'm David Colma, and the other guy is Dorian Wallace. You heard him woo. That's me. And we're composers and leftists, and we talk about music and politics and whatever the fuck we want to talk about. So how's everything going, yeah. Dorian? Well, you know, we're uh, both living in the middle of a pandemic, mm-hmm. uh, the COVID-19. Um, I lost basically all of my work for the next uh coming future right uh martha graham dance company suspended uh all of their classes and i play there and i teach there and my internship the american music therapy association basically put a suspension on all music therapy interns uh for 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 the time being so those are my two main sources of income uh and then to add on to it all of my gigs which were money uh (laughs) It, th- those also got canceled, right? So, including uh, including the gig we've uh, we yeah. multiple times uh, said we were having. Yeah, the yeah. Robert Ashley gig is postponed. Yes, so. uh, it'll and it looks as the days go by, it'll be even later and later. Yes, um, yes. So yeah. we'll see you in twenty twenty two. My goodness. Okay. Yeah. 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 So and, it, literally how, everything stopped. Yeah. Okay. How about you, David? Oh well. Um, my the so my the my sort of mini gig of um, reviewing concerts the at least mm. one of the concerts that i was supposed to review has been canceled so i haven't really gone to any concerts in a couple of weeks um i have a couple of things to write about in the offing that i have to write about i'm gonna help write a review about the microtonal festival i went to a few weeks ago and i'm writing a preview piece for the anniversary of the cleveland composers guild that I have to start working on, but it's gotten a little more complicated to do so because I was going to do some research in some Let's libraries, and those libraries are uh, now closed. So, um, but uh, my main gig uh, teaching at Kent State University has um, uh, been uh, re- has been turned over to remote instruction, which we began on Monday after being after they canceled three uh, three days last week, and I found out just a few days ago that we're going to do this for the rest of the semester. So Mm. my semester at Kent is now in my, in this room, my office, I will be doing it from here. Great. um, So it means I don't spend two hours in the car every day. So I've been given granted 56 more days of 56 more hours of my life because of this, but it's made the Mm. teaching more difficult. I mean, I know how to do all this stuff. And I'm going to have to spend some more time and be a little more available to my students, which is not a problem. I want to be helpful to them. But Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in a certain sense, I'd rather be teaching in person. But this is actually it makes my day to day living easier because I I can actually like, I don't know, uh, not need a nap in the middle of the afternoon. Yeah. And I can like actually do work when I'm not working on school stuff because I come home exhausted. So. My quality of life has gone up, although I'm not really necessarily um, happy about why. <laughs> I mean, so when I was supposed to vote in Ohio today, yes, and uh, the governor um, literally uh, attempted to postpone the election, failed to postpone the election, and then did it anyway. And then the Ohio State Supreme Court said, uh, sure. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll get to vote at some point. I'm not sure when that'll be, but I'm grateful to not have had to because, uh, the stories I'm hearing from about, from Illinois or in Arizona and Florida today sound like, uh, disasters. So I'm, I'm, well, they're just, they're having, they're not following the CDC guidelines about, you know, not having more than 50 people in a room, staying six feet apart and all these things. They're not necessarily, they're not cleaning stuff between people using things it's it's just a it's it's there are going to be more people in those places that who will have covid-19 because of this yeah that's my expectation 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or totally. I should say my guess. I, I'm not a I'm not an expert. But um Yeah. So it's um it's a very it, let's put it this way. It's a very surreal time. <laughs> so I made yes. Yes, I it made is. I made five hundred stupid videos over the course of more than a year and a half like a year and a half a few mm-hmm. years ago. Yes. And I basically stopped making them because I stopped being funny because it really wasn't possible to be funny when Donald Trump became president because the actual real world was too strange for me to make fun of it. I mean, I was also just ran out of ideas. But, sure. But I sort of feel like that right now. It's just sort of like, this is, I can't, if you if you pitched what's going on right now to a movie executive, they go... Yeah, it's a little on the nose. You know, it's like, yeah, no, no. That's, that's, you know, it's too... I don't really think that's believable. You're really telling me we're going to take the dumbest president we've ever had and we're going to do a a worldwide pandemic where the carriers are people who don't know that or who aren't sick um, and then uh, force that to, because of the way the world economy works that it's going to literally put us every, put everybody into a recession because our economy is based on service workers and we've just took service workers and said, hey, uh, you're not going to work anymore. Um, during an election year. And, during, and then during a presidential election. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, you know, it's just like, yeah. it makes World War Z look like a, you know, um, you know, a Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... That that obviously that's um, hyperbole. Um, yeah. Anyway, but yeah. So I just I'm, you know, I'm fine. I'm actually pretty good, but the world is going to shit. Yeah, yeah. It's um it's very surreal. Uh, cause right now my wife and I were we're enjoying the time together that we normally haven't had, but it's in the back of our minds. What is this going to be like? in a month right and what is this going to be like in two months right. you know when 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 all of a sudden it's like yeah it was nice to have a few days off together as opposed to wow we have been trapped in this fucking apartment for for two months and we have not made any income i believe that um, andrew cuomo the governor of new york said mm-hmm. recently that the peak is going to be in 45 days okay so okay. so it means that guess how long we won't be doing stuff for longer than 45 days yeah 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 so it's it's gonna be yeah you know i agree it's it's like you know uh right now it feels like a vacation or a snow day still mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it really hasn't sunk in that it's this is like a new normal that we're we don't understand yes luckily for us anarchists it's proving that um uh, the amount of work we do is most of it's unnecessary. Oh yeah, this this <laughs> made this made bullshit jobs almost like a prophetic text. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. David Graeber, yeah. prophet. Yeah. There yeah. you go. <laughs> Though he would deny that because oh, of course uh, he, he doesn't. Yeah. As an anarchist, we don't care about profits. No, no, absolutely. In in no. any realm. <laughs> no. <laughs> Whichever way not. you want to spell that. Right. Right. Yeah. No. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I do have some positive uh, news uh, just from the course that I'm teaching at the Martha Graham School. Okay. Uh, so their last assignment I gave them was they had to... they oh, So the, the premise of the class was was um, finding finding music and how to how to diversify the places that they look for music when they're when they're looking to collaborate or when they're looking to choreograph to a recording or something like that. Sure. And so um, the premise that we ended up uh, going by was that there is nothing wrong with being interested in collaborating or working with a composer or performer who is a straight white male, uh, cisgender. However, if the reason you are choosing to work with this person is because you are oblivious of anybody else, uh, then you shouldn't work with that person until you are 
completely firm that their music is the music you absolutely want to be working with. Um, so I gave them an assignment, and we we're, uh, we use the um, the Institute for Composer Diversity. Mm-hmm. Uh, I showed them that website. And the whole thing was that they had to write a one-page analysis. And keep in mind, this isn't like music theory oriented. It's more like, what did it make you feel like? What? Oh you yeah, know, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, but it had to be something, some music that they didn't know about until they began looking this week. Okay. Um, and you know, and it was just like, is it interesting? And so, anyways, I've gotten a couple of papers already. Uh, they're actually due. Uh, you know, in a couple of days, but I started getting them popping in, and you know, like for instance, one of one of uh, my students, she was saying how she got interested in music from John Williams, uh, specifically Home Alone, sure. and it was because as a kid, she made the realization, the connection that Home Alone sounded very similar to the Nutcracker, mm-hmm. um, and so she really fell in love with uh, with John Williams' music, and you know, just even stuff like you know, just look at the generation. Like he did the Harry Potter soundtrack for the first three, and right. Um, so anyway, so she said that that opened up her being interested in music, and specifically the sort of cinematic, story-driven music that led her to a career, uh, to pursue a career in dance, um, and. Uh, she then went on to talk about how that got her interested in listening to orchestral music. And she was like, though I think that John Williams uh, deserves every accolade he's been given, and he's one of my favorite composers, I was so touched to find out that there is a female composer from uh, from Israel who is writing very dramatic orchestral music and of course the name is uh slipping my mind right at this moment but anyways uh, in, in the paper my student had apparently found a composer a female composer uh and was digging into all of her music and she's aware of it now and it was just it was very cool to uh to you know just by giving them the prompt to look beyond what's the obvious uh you know they're they're finding they're finding other options to 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 investigate and explore. Sure. Um, and yeah, it, it's uh, it's been it's been very very fulfilling, like very good teacher moment. Um, Sounds like you've opened up their avenues. Well, hopefully, I, I you know I and and the whole the whole point is like I did want to stress at the beginning uh, that it's like don't like you know we don't have to like become a segre like we don't have to. Uh, put up segregation you know we don't have to be pushing for that but we also shouldn't be doing it as the status quo like you know we we like we like there, there are so many brilliant artists out there who never get the light of day because of circumstances uh it, it, the, and and we, it's our responsibility as artists to find these people and you know bring them to light mm-hmm. uh and you know, it opened up a very good class discussion as well, because uh, we were talking about, you know, one of the arguments for, for one of the arguments against diversity in programming. This is such a dumb argument. I don't believe in this point at all. But it was still something that just came up in the conversation. But it was that, it was that. Well, if we start pushing it this way, people who really don't deserve to be at the top are all of a sudden getting there. What do you think the current thing yeah, is? Exactly. It's like, it's like, so what's been going on anyways? Okay, great. So, well, well, do you think what we have is a meritocracy? Yeah, exactly. I mean, coming frank, I, for, for fucking out loud, the reason you're making the arguments you are is because the, yeah. the system isn't meritocratic. Yeah. Now, I should have, uh, I should point this out. That this argument, um, I've heard this argument brought up in sincerity uh, out oh, sure. in the real world by uh, by cis white men. Of course. <laughs> and I um, always have a qualm with it. Uh, but, Still there, Dorian? Um, in my classroom, it's mostly a diverse group of... Dorian, um, you still there? Oh my goodness, I think I lost David. Uh, oh God, hold hey, on. Hey, Dorian. Well, I'm going to talk. Maybe I'm not going to talk. Lo-fi technology. 
Hello. All right. Hey, David, did I lose yeah. you? You All did right, cool. somehow. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to reel it back to what I was saying. But, sure. Um, you, um, before you do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you been continuously recording? Uh, yes, it's still Okay, going. so I'll edit this chunk out. Great. So cool. just just say the sentence. You The one that I last one I heard you say was... Um, oh, fuck, it left me. Um, so what were we talking about again? <laughs> Diversity. Yeah, yeah. So um, you had let in, you had, you had said something about, no, we'll just leave this in. Yeah, okay. just leave it in. It's fine. <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> yeah. All good. No, uh, just, just, I've heard this argument brought up, you know, sincerely by cis straight white men, like where they're actually saying like, well, these people are making it to the top, blah, blah, blah. And it, it's, which is a bullshit argument, but it is, um, I will say that in my class, it is a large majority uh, people who identify as female. Um, and I'd say half the class, maybe a little less than half, is people of color as well. Um, plus, there's a large amount of LGBTQ um, just within the dance community uh, in general. So these arguments were more being brought up like, well, what about when people think this? Right. Uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, well, what about... No. All the people who, yeah, like it was that that wasn't the argument that was getting brought up. It I think it's funny, Dorian, would, that when you yeah. when you're when you're p- putting on the voice of someone making those arguments, you make them sound stupid. I think that's well, because they are stupid. <laughs> so, right. Well, sure. Well, so it's the yeah. Let's well, it's, it's the major problem of this idea that somehow the current system we have is somehow a meritocracy. That yeah. the things that already are, are the things that are already out there that are, people know about are already good, right? And those things are the best things because we know about them, mm-hmm. which is just ludicrous. Yeah, and I've only lived in a capitalist society, therefore capitalism's the best system. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> well, wh- why wouldn't that be the case? Yeah. You know, well, it just goes to show you how conservative most people are. Mm-hmm. So that can pivot to the, so what we were talking about before we started recording is that you were talking about what it's like to talk to liberals right now. Yeah. yeah. So this, we, we're in this middle of this thing where it appears that Joe Biden has basically won the nomination, although it's not mathematically mm-hmm. completely true yet, but it's most likely. And based on yeah. the way that the voting's going today, probably um, um, Biden's probably going to win. Uh, yeah. these states today and so bernie and so every day it's becoming more and more of a thing for bernie sanders to drop out of the race and uh, yeah. we have to we have to coalesce around joe biden and of course um when you and i think about voting for joe biden what's the first thought that comes into your head <laughs> it makes me want to vomit in my mouth right exactly <laughs> so so but that that but the real issue at this point is that in many situations we're in, we're surrounded by people who wouldn't would never think something negative about Joe Biden other than he's old. Yeah. So what's it like yeah. to talk to people like that? Yeah, well, so uh, the thing that we were talking about right before we had recorded was, uh, you know, and th- these are anecdotal pieces right, of but course. we were talking about sharing the podcast and being as blunt with some of our political views in certain social spheres um because you know uh i'm not going to speak for you david but sure. i'm going to speak ass- assumptively is uh you know david and i basically float around the anarcho syndicalist world or the uh the libertarian socialist world or somewhere in the you know green anarchism so, some fucking form of anarchist uh, something where something where you advocate uh bernie sanders style um uh democratic socialism right. as a hedge because otherwise that's the only way you can participate in elections yeah yeah right and and of course like the the society i you know i i'm very into the idea of democratic confederalism uh like what's going on in rojava um and uh just just also also like with social ecology which is where you put a um nature centered uh green economic policies right um 
ahead of profit making and, and right. those sorts of so Which those is, sorts and, of and some of these things that, that you can basically argue as a member of a socialist party or a green party yeah. or yeah um even the democratic socialists of america would agree with some of these things yeah, so it's, yeah. but yeah but we're, we're clearly farther left than any of that stuff yeah and the the other thing is between uh the um anarchist versus authoritarian um we're on the anarchist side of things uh well i right. guess uh, bottom and top the top libertarian top. versus um authoritarian yeah yeah exactly so uh you know we're equally as critical of joseph stalin as we are of adolf hitler or donald trump or ron paul uh <laughs> right so yeah which would those those people occupy the other corners of the the compass chart thing yeah, yeah exactly exactly um and you know and there are certain realms where you do align uh in certain areas like i actually am on board with ron paul as far as his views on on war and i'm on board with his views on um you know on, on just the basic concepts of liberty however i find his economic views to be very fascist uh <laughs> you know they they tend to uh they tend to trump those other views when it comes down yeah. to real world examples yeah yes and and also the man himself uh is a bit of a homophobe and a bit of a racist uh that yeah we could we could we don't even need to use a bit yeah. Yeah. yeah he's he's that he's both of those right um but then you know like e even um like let's look at like vladimir lenin like i think as far as particular realms of you know worker controlled um worker controlled society uh like we like I, I agree with some of his writing it's just the whole vanguard and use of violence and force to right. uh the dictatorship of where we don't like the dictatorship of the proletariat because it's a yeah. dictatorship. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, all know, of like, 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 for example, like, so Bernie Sanders says that he yeah. doesn't think that billionaires should exist. Mm -hmm. Lenin would agree because Lenin would want to murder all the billionaires. Yeah. We agree because we think those billionaires should give us their money and then they're also equally as well off as us. Yeah. Because we're all better off. Right. And they get to be less of a sociopath because they don't have all that money. Right. We don't want to kill them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And neither does Bernie Sanders, by the way. Right, Just right. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, um right. people people that fit in the libertarian socialist like realm of the spectrum. Yeah. Uh, there's you know, there's Rosa Luxemburg, there's Gandhi, there's Noam Chomsky, there's actually albert einstein just right. to put it in there uh mm -hmm. there's bertrand russell there's cornell west uh you know there's there's martin luther king jr um there, there's yeah. a lot of people who fit in this this realm. lower um, the lower left quadrant yeah 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 mm -hmm. so all of that to say is it's interesting um being blunt about certain political views in this realm uh mm -hmm. because for any of you who do follow me on social media, uh, you're aware of how I verbally combat people. Um, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's like it's uh, I, I've got a, a strong social media presence, especially on Facebook. Uh, uh, and I have zero problem fighting with uh, with conservatives. I have zero problem fighting with right wing libertarians. I have zero problem. I have zero problem fighting with fascists. I have zero problem fighting with authoritarian communists. Uh, I have no problem with this. I do have a bit of an issue arguing with liberal centrists, um, just because I don't really think they're ideologically bad people. I think they're just kind of oblivious to people that are outside of their social circles. Um, and there are certain realms that it's that they're not wrong. Um, let me put it this way: I got into a, a discussion with a friend of mine. Um, he's an older man, LGBTQ, uh, and he's a, a, a an adamant Biden supporter. And you know, I I posted a joke about Joe Biden uh, during the Democratic debate. 
that every time Biden spoke, uh, it's like, why does every time Joe Biden speaks, I want to vomit my mouth? And another guy who's uh, in the realm that you and I are in, David, uh, he posted because he's Trump 2.0. And I liked it. (laughs) I liked the comment. And it just fucking turned into, like, all these these liberals popping up. Uh, It was really only, like, two or three liberals. But they Uh, kept on going. Oh, it kept going on and on and on. And the thing I actually did find beautiful was a lot of my my leftist uh 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 female identifying comrades <laughs> popped up and were like going to battle over this um which was a beautiful thing to watch because uh the identity politics couldn't get played the way it may have gone if i had argued um i guess all of my like my like really deep uh deep thoughts on all of this um but but it was just one of those things where it was like it was like dude i'm i'm criticizing i'm criticizing a politician like this isn't a personal attack on on you as a human um and and you know like <clears throat> I actually, do, do you have anything to add to this, David, just before I continue? Yeah, before you just kind of... Yeah. Just, yeah. Are you aware of the Funky Academic on YouTube? No. So I... His name is... Um, I've heard him say it a bunch of times, but he says it so fast that I can't reproduce it. Hirami okay. Obey, he's got a He's got a lovely name. I just can't say it. Let me look it up. Anyway, okay. just if you type that into... so. He, he showed up on The Rising this week. Oh, okay. And um, um, his name is Ir- Irame Osai Frimpong. And I'm saying his name wrong. I apologize. But anyway, this is a brilliant guy. Um, I was watching some of his videos. And he made a video after um, South Carolina happened. So he's a black guy, obviously. And he lives in Georgia. He's, going, he's in graduate school at the University okay. of Georgia. And he made a point that black people in, in the South Carolina, people have been saying like low information voter stuff, right? Which, of course, is a technical term in political science, but it's for some reason it's taken on this identity term aspect right now. Yeah. So the ways, in which it's in, the ways in which it's accurate is in that it refers to people who don't follow politics. The other, but... but the thing is that these people are not low information in other ways that people tend to assume who think that African Americans in the South should vote for certain people and we don't understand why they don't. And right. he basically made the point in this video that the reason that black people in the South look at Bernie Sanders like he's a fucking nut job, he didn't use those words, that's mine, is that um, he is coming down to a basically a colonial state where white people rule and there are black people around and they have, they have not had any control over government since reconstruction. And you, and Bernie Sanders is saying, Hey, let's get all these wonderful things that you know you want. And like, Oh yeah, we want those things. But what we have to do is we have to get all these white people that are around you to willingly vote, to let you have these things. And black people, react to that these the uh, older african americans go <laughs> are you fucking insane yeah and so they get and so they choose somebody else because bernie sanders to the and the phrase he used was bernie sanders and to a certain extent elizabeth warren come off as marianne william like marianne williamson does to the rest of the united states hmm. to black vote to african american older african americans in the south Okay. Which makes perfect sense. So in a certain sense, your friend, who is an older gay person, has lived yeah. through a period of time in which gay people have not had rights. Yes. And you and I are used to gay people having a certain amount of social freedom and rights. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Bernie Sanders is saying all these wonderful things, but the, your friend was making this saying that he's never going to get anything passed. He's never gotten anything passed. He's just this crazy person spouting lovely ideas, and yeah. we're assuming that white people, straight people in this country, are going to purposefully vote to let uh-huh. gay people have these things? Yeah. I mean, no, he's basically that, making that point. 
that makes perfect sense actually uh right yeah so, it, and yeah. so it becomes personal because their their examination of the political thing is mm-hmm. i'm a person who is not who is who is not being protected by this society and your guy who's saying i can protect you has no track record to show that therefore he's dangerous yeah because he can't get it to happen you no, know that, it's the, that all makes a lot of sense whereas biden although he's not promising those things has a track record of getting things done. Lots mm-hmm. of terrible things, but he actually has a track record of getting things done. <clears throat> like yeah. he got he got um he got Anita Hill on oh no <laughs> he, he got Anita Hill shoved down so that Clarence Thomas could be on the court. <laughs> yeah. He he did the, the I mean just like uh, we can list and list and list things. Yeah. He voted for the so, Patriot Act. Right. It's yeah. the you know um, he advocated for the Iraq War, like he was yeah. the he was the person in the Democratic Caucus that made sure that it got pushed through. I mean, yeah. So, so it's the, but, I mean, it really does come from a completely diff- fundamentally different understanding of the world and of the role of politics in our lives and who is out to protect us and who isn't. Yeah. No, that that uh, the point you just made really does add some clarity, uh, at least ev- even if this isn't um, how my friend was necessarily uh, conceiving it. It just it it does kind of help me look at it in a different way. Oh, yeah, uh, he would probably say it differently. But based sure, upon sure. reading his yeah. comments and seeing what he was talking about and what really worried him and what his charges against yeah. Sanders were, it was the same yeah. kind of frame. Right. Now that that makes a lot of sense. The 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 other thing that was so interesting was um, a lot of the people that were um, that were coming in uh, for defense. Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of the female uh, identifying participants who who jumped on. They're all uh, millennials. And they're all leftists in the post Me Too world, right? So they look at somebody like Joe Biden as a creeper, right? Um, and and they were making that point very bluntly in the comments as well, uh, to 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 my 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 friend who was getting offended by the by the Biden comments. And right. then to add on to it, some of my left wing military friends, people I either served with or people who I know through um, various activist organizations were popping on. And their reason for not liking Biden is his military record mm-hmm. uh, and, and his war record. Um, so yeah, it's uh, well, the, the other the, thing the, I think we need to yeah. keep in mind is that yes, yes. The, most of the people supporting Biden aren't supporting Biden because they like him. Yeah, that's true. Or they don't think those things are a problem. It just so happens that they're the people that support the centrist. So the main difference between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party in our society is that the Republican base doesn't trust its Republican leaders ever. Yeah. They stand up and if their Republican leaders do something they don't like, they shout and they scream at them. And they demand someone else replace them. And that's yeah. why that's why there's always this fluid leadership and that young people actually gain power more quickly in the Republican Party because no one is safe. Yeah, that makes sense. The people in the I mean, Democratic like a, like Party... Right. The people in the Democratic Party are liked by Democrats. True. People in the Democratic Party, they like Joe Biden. They like Barack Obama. They like Nancy Pelosi. They like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. They like all these people. And therefore, they might have supported somebody else in um, in the election. But when it comes down to the person that's going to protect them or the person that they care about, the think will do the best for them is Joe Biden because he's the one that's left standing. So, I mean... And most of them would probably vote for Bernie had Bernie um, gotten more people to be interested. But there are a lot of people who are right. against him, right? So it's the – that's the thing is that in the end, Democrats are institutionalists. And so they like their institutions. Yeah. And the people who run those institutions have therefore have credibility. 
I mean, that's the reason, like, for example, if we compare the Republican leadership in the Congress to the Democratic leadership in the Congress, who is it? In the, in the Dem, in, for the House, the, the, the last speaker of the House was Paul Ryan. How old is Paul Ryan? Oh, he's, he's got to be in his, his 40s. 40s? Maybe yeah. he might be 50 now. I mean, yeah. how old is Nancy Pelosi? Right. Nan- and how old is Steny Hoyer? <laughs> and how old is James Clyburn? I mean, there isn't even a young person in the Democratic leadership at all, I think. I mean, the, like the next level down, and there might be somebody who's 40, like a number four or five. But those people don't have the power of the upper three. Yeah, people like their, I mean, seniority matters in the Democratic Party. So this is this, I mean, this is the difference between Democratic vote. I mean, and Democratic voters don't hold their leaders to account. The only time they did was after Donald Trump got elected and it lasted how long? Six months? Right. I mean, it was it was the women's march mm-hmm. and the and the the Muslim ban protest. But notice that every time Donald Trump expands the Muslim ban, we don't go back out. Yeah, exactly. That the women's march has stopped. They don't do it anymore. So, um, so Paul Ryan is 50, just turned 50. Yeah, so, so he was under 50 when he was still in Congress. And Nancy Pelosi is about to turn 70. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's just, it's the major difference. Now, it doesn't mean yeah. that the Republicans don't have old people that run their things. I mean, they got, oh, yeah. the, those tend to be the rich billionaires that, that run those people, right? I mean, oh my, oh my God, sorry, I did my math wrong. Oh. Uh, yeah, sorry, she, she's, she's 79. She's, yeah, she's about, almost 80. <laughs> yeah, almost 80. Yeah, so I thought she was yeah. older than that. Yeah, yeah. so, so it's, the, that's this distinction is that Republicans, the Republican voters, stay invigorated no matter what happens because they don't trust their leaders. Democrats want to turn up, vote, and then go to brunch. Yeah. The the way I heard it uh, really well described once was Democrats fall in love, Republicans fall in line. Right. Um, yeah, that's a, a friend of mine who's a former Republican described it so that way. It's worth going into this funky academic guy's stuff. I re- really recommend you watch his most recent video on populism on the right and the left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he really goes into this thing that basically the people on the left and conservatives and then on the far right actually base their ideology in a bedrock set of moral logic and mm-hmm. like really like values that are unimpeachable in some sense, right? There's like lines you don't cross and the world should be this way and we need to make it happen. Whereas liberals are basically operating under an expanded market ideology. Right. So his point is that the reason that Democrats do really like they, they just think everything is up to taste. Mm. So it's like, well, I like this. And if I, well, if I don't like that anymore, then I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So it means that they're, they're just sort of, they're, they, the, their idea of being political is to, is to get to the point where they don't have to do politics anymore. One thing that's, that's so interesting, just kind of processing this, and, and we've talked about this at length before. Right. Yeah, multiple uh, other podcasts at least. Yeah, yeah, but, yes, and, yes. Um, plenty of times other than that, right? Uh, but, but how um, one reason leftists have an actual qualm with conservatives is because we understand that they have an ideology they have a principle that they're following right um it's tradition yes yes and 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 security and we thoroughly disagree with that principle but we have our own sets of principles and so it's frustrating to not to 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 be around around liberal thinkers uh when they don't seem to hold their elected officials or their uh, it t- accountable for for all of their actions and all of right. their behavior, right. um, you know. And, and I mean, this is this is the thing that makes it uh, confusing for for myself. Just when reflecting all this stuff, like I don't actually have a qualm with any politician as a human being. Um, I once had an interesting conversation with my mother, who's 
you know, very, very conservative. And it came up, it came up about Hillary Clinton. Uh, this was back in 2016. And I, sort of had this empathetic statement that was uh that was you know you really have to like feel bad for some of these people like uh you know whether or not like who who they are in their political positions like it's got to be like psychologically tough to like just have people rip you apart from every angle and pretend that it you know doesn't phase you uh or come off as strong or something like that and it was just so fascinating because, um, like, when, when we look at my views on Hillary Clinton as far as her her political uh, life and her the policies she stood behind, um, I you know I don't I don't agree with her. I don't like her at all, really. But all I was doing was was sort of analyzing her as a human being uh, because she was just getting you know, destroyed from so many different places. Right. And my mother couldn't comprehend that she was a person. (laughs) And it's, it's partially because the right had done such a good job of lionizing her. Oh, Um, well, the, 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 the lionizing, lionizing means the opposite of what you mean. Oh, uh, yes. The, the antonym. Yeah. Yeah. Demonizing her. Demonizing. Yes. Um, and and so that being said, uh, it's it, it it seems that um, sort of in a, a very generic generic um, analysis on on how liberals tend to think um, is they they see the human being and they don't necessarily care about the policies. Uh, yeah, well, the, that's that's pretty much the way all of the 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 fallout from the most recent debate, the two yeah. Biden versus Bernie debate, is like they don't care about what Biden voted for. He's yeah. the person that they should vote for. Yeah, exactly. He's Uncle Joe. Yeah, and so it's just it's just I I really felt that. Um, well, it's like watching, for example, Dorian, like if yeah, yeah, Bernie yeah. Sanders didn't, if Bernie Sanders the man. Who we tend to like, he seems like a, he's a decent person, it seems like. Yeah. If he didn't advocate the policies he advocated, if he completely threw them out, we'd throw them out in the next trash. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, we don't we don't like Bernie. We, we like Bernie because Bernie does the things we want someone like that to do. Yeah, exactly. That he's a nice guy is nice. Right? But I don't... It the, it's not about him. Yeah, that's not your interest in him as a politician. Right, but people were interested in Pete Buttigieg because of Pete Buttigieg. Yeah, exactly. Not because of what Pete Buttigieg said about like packing the Supreme Court, or what yeah. Pete Buttigieg said about, or you know, or they don't care about Elizabeth Warren because Elizabeth Warren is for uh, was wanted to green the military to come up with one of her more silly things. Um, yeah. Right, it's it's the, it was the fact that Elizabeth Warren is a is a competent, intelligent woman, who had a lot of ideas that she seemingly could implement because she's a smart, capable person. It's not what she was advocating. That was a secondary point. Right. I mean, so it's. Um, I mean, of course, there are people that are farther left who actually care about who actually have an ideology based around policy who would advocate for her Mm -hmm. but but that's not the reason the people the people who thought that by and large who cared about policy Mm -hmm. most of them had moved on to bernie months you know way before it got time to vote yeah right the only people that were still with her were the um very specific like uh, women of color, trans, mm-hmm. and uh, LGBT activists who had gotten her ear, and so she was advocating very specific, mm-hmm. um, very specific, you know, racial justice, uh, social justice issues. Um, that which is, you know, probably why everybody else abandoned her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> I mean, you know, totally. it's like well, you know, we're sitting here and Bernie's getting thirty eight percent of the vote at the most. I mean, come on. I mean, it's like we we completely understand that, you know, people look at Bernie Sanders and go, no. Right. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, right, it's just like, you know, and... Well, that's the thing that I've been trying to think about lately is this, as, as it's become more and more likely that we're not going to get the person that you and I are, it's the best chance, but man, it would be better if he was farther left kind of person. And it seems less likely that it's going to happen. It's like, how do we manage to, like, I've been reading people who are very, who are from the left, but they're not like far left people who are, who are criticizing how he handled his campaign just to get a different kind of viewpoint. Mm -hmm. on this and i'm what interests me is that they're advocating that bernie should have been more of a normal person like he should have he he basically had planned his campaign on everybody else would stay in the race so i only need to get 35 percent of people to vote for me and i'll win and as soon as everybody and as soon as they all coalesced he had no way to win more than 30 percent of the 35 percent of the vote which yeah, is what's yeah, yeah, basically yeah. happened. Yeah. But the thing is that they didn't realize that he actually had the ability to get other, since other people liked him enough, and if, if he had done his campaign a different way, mm -hmm. he probably could have gotten other people to vote for him. Because, you know, he could have been more patriotic. He could actually call himself a Democrat. He could wear a flag pin. He could talk about freedom. And he could talk, instead of talking about uh, Denmark, he can talk about uh, FDR. That was uh, one of one of the things I, I saw recently. Um, David Pakman brought up was yeah. Pakman he, talks about this stuff. Yeah, yeah. he was pushing uh, social democracy uh, uh, policy points, but then he was identifying as a democratic socialist, and right. that just adds confusion in the headlines because it's right. like if you say democratic socialist, people can call you a socialist, and no socialist would say you know would say sanders is a is a hardline socialist no like, right uh but anybody who isn't a socialist can be like oh he's a socialist you don't tr you, we can't trust socialists uh right so you know that, right. that and that actually matters to older voters yeah it does it does so yeah i just i'm trying to figure out you know what what is the path forward at this point yeah and so, i don't really know so here's um do you, do you ever follow Bo of the fifth column uh no i haven't i mean you've mentioned him a bunch but i haven't yeah. actually dug into his stuff he's a he's a gonzo journalist um uh very anarchistic in his thinking um but one of his hypotheses and this and this by the way does not mean that we shouldn't be vigilant against um social change and uh that we shouldn't be wary about authoritarianism or fascism creeping in but one of the things that the sanders campaign really is important for is you know just just looking at 2016 sanders was an outsider candidate and this year all the democrats were saying the same speaking points as he was in 2016. Yeah. So already that shift has begun. Um, right. but, but anyways, um, Bo has said that he does not suspect, and I think he's a little older than you or me, maybe mid-40s. Uh, he said he does not suspect that he will ever see his idealistic uh, uh, society run the way that he, he imagines it would be, which would be in a more more libertarian socialist uh realm but but he suspects that it could take three generations if we continue to push push certain things and push certain elements and that sanders uh though he you know really won't he won't be president um he was such an important um uh stepping stone uh but, you know, the, the, this is also assuming that society always gets more progressive, which it easily could fall the opposite way. Um, yeah, the, what Ta-Nehisi Coates says, well, you know, sometimes uh, uh, history bends toward the Holocaust. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the idea that history that um, pro history bends toward progress or justice. Yeah. History bends, that, that Martin Luther King Jr. line. So, yeah, I just... yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, like, clearly, I mean, well, here's the thing, Dorian, is that if anything, the 
I mean, there are ways in which things have become more progressive, but there are ways in which things have become more conservative among Democrats. Oh, yeah. Among Democrats. I'm not yeah. talking about, like, Trump and conservatives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, hell, Dorian, who is standing around right now advocating that they should put lump sums of money into pe- regular people, working class people, people's pockets? <laughs> Mitt Romney yeah. and Tom Cotton. Yeah. I mean, and who is standing in the way of doing this? According to my the th- stuff I'm seeing, Nancy Pelosi. Right? I mean, there are people advocating it on the left. I mean, like um, Jared Brown, Kamala Harris is one, uh, Tulsi Gabbard has one. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, so it's, you know, the Yang has gotten some, like, people are like, hey, you know that thing Yang was talking about? Let's yeah. do some version of that. Yeah. And I was like, it's the weirdest thing. It is very strange. Um, so, you know, it's like, the thing is, Doreen, is that what's dangerous about this moment is that it's possible that right-wing populism will be more successful than left-wing populism in this country. Right? We had the Donald Trump election, mm-hmm. but it's not like he had like populist followers, right? There wasn't anybody in the, in the Republican Party that was like, hey, you know, Trump... And the way, like, why do we actually do what Trump advocated, which is, like, actually helping working class people, which he hasn't really done? Yeah. But what if they actually advocated that and they actually did it? I mean, that's the thing is, like, it's possible. Yeah. I mean, you know, so that's the thing is that. Jesus Christ. I mean, like that, that's sort of that's the nightmare, nightmare scenario. In my yeah, mind. it really is. If Donald Trump turns around and gives regular people a thousand bucks a month for the foreseeable future of COVID-19, he gets reelected. Because here's the deal is like we've all been assuming for the past week that because of the because of because of the pandemic, mm-hmm. that Donald Trump would bungle it so bad that he would take a political hit. And he has. Like if there's if the economy continues going down, which it looks that seems likely, that could harm him. Mm-hmm. But the Democrats are not. They're they're kind of sitting on their hands in a certain way right now about how they handle this. Which means that Trump could beat them. If, you know, because with like the polls right now more people think Donald Trump is handling what's going on well versus not. It was 47 to 43 in a poll. Oy. So, I mean, like, that's the thing is, like, I was thinking, like, a few days ago, that's like, oh, well, okay, well, we're going to go into a recession and people are going to be dying. That's going to make it more likely that Donald Trump doesn't get elected. And, okay, we'll, 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 have, we'll deal with Biden as president, right? Okay. Right. That makes it more likely that Biden will be president. Right. But, you know, there are ways this could go where Biden loses because Trump does something extremely popular. The thing people underestimate about Donald Trump. I mean, that's the thing. Can you imagine a new deal for the right? Yeah. The thing that's people, the thing that frightens me. The thing people underestimate about Donald Trump is that that man is very adaptable. Yeah. He, he he does not he doesn't have an ideology because he oh, doesn't no. need one. Right. He, well his ideology is him. Yes. Exactly. How can I become more powerful? How can I Right. Yeah, it's I mean so yeah, he the thing I keep pointing out to a lot of people, uh have been pointing out for the last four fucking years, is the dude has had is it four or six bankruptcies? I've, I've read both. Um, uh, depends on how you count them. Yes. Well, so he's had a <laughs> but lot so of yes, bankruptcies. One of he, those numbers. He he ran a fraudulent university. <laughs> he, yeah. Well, you know he 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 completely uh, you know he he has screwed over so many working class people. He has, you know he has done all this like horrendous stuff like openly. Right. And he has never gone to prison. He's never faced uh, prison time for it. Right. And, and he it's, won't. No, he won't. And it's like, it's like y'all have to realize, like, yeah, he flies, like, right up to the sun, but he never goes in. Like, he yeah. gets right to where he's 
almost going to get hurt. And then he doesn't. And it's worse for everyone else except him. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so well, it's know, like... The, yeah, go ahead. Well, well, so just, you know, for for people to put up the, the like, oh, yeah, COVID-19, that this will be his downfall. It's just like, it's like, there have been so many times we think it's his downfall. Well, here's the deal is that this is like, this is an order of magnitude worse than anything else. Yeah. Right? I mean, like mishandling a pandemic and then overseeing a economic like a bad economy that i mean that gets you on on doesn't get you reelected yeah i mean i mean just like for example during i mean in ohio right now mike dewine the republican governor is is handling himself really well in a really trustworthy way yeah that means if people remember this in a couple of years i mean he'll get reelected you know, during Hurricane Sandy, uh, Chris Christie's handled it very well in New Jersey, right. yeah. um, and that that like did him. That that's why he was even considered up for presidency in 2016. Right. Um, he turned out to be an awful human, and everybody figured it out quickly enough. Oh but, yeah, sure. But um, but that being said, he kept his cool during Sandy, and he made a lot of good good short term decisions. Um, right. And and by the way, everybody, we want elected officials to handle crises. Yes. <laughs> well. Yeah. Just because we want them to do the right thing. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Just because <laughs> you're a Republican that. doesn't mean I want you to do a bad job <laughs> in the middle of a I mean, crisis. Like, right. Right. In the middle of a pandemic, please do your job well. Yeah. In the middle of a hurricane, please do your job well. Yeah. Exactly. I don't want people to die. Oh, no. The oh, what was I gonna say? It was the, the thing that I just. What were you saying? It'll come back to me. Yeah. There was there was a thought I had about three minutes ago that I wanted to talk about. Um, it's that. I'm just. I'm not. Oh, so the the. It's basically Dorian is that the people that. The people that are liberals, because they don't pay attention, but they do. Some of them they really do. do. They really do. They pay attention. And I, I just think it's not fair to them mm -hmm. to say that they just don't know enough or that they're ignorant of certain people's yeah. experiences. It's that they don't care about those other things. And they want... Mm. They like drone strikes. They like shoving it to the poor they like the fact that the homeless can't get a leg up i mean you know they won't say so and they'll get really angry when you say that to them but you'll just say well here's the deal let me put a hypothetical to you yeah say the height say that you live in a very nice place and all of a sudden let's let's put let's take uh let's take half of the white people in where you live and let's make them black and latino and that means the, the, the school in down the street where you send your kids is now more than 50% not white. Do you think that school is still as good as it was? And then you wait as they can't think. I mean, well, of course, what they'll say is, oh, of course, it'll be just fine. It's like, well, but you're not going to act that way when it happens. Mm. Because it's the thing is like when it comes down to your children, liberals act like conservatives. Like because they don't have a th they because their ideology won't let them make the choice that I'm going to sacrifice a little of my child's economic possibilities in the future mm -hmm. so that the the uh, my neighbors, the black children in my community can have a better school. Mm hmm. I mean, some people make that decision. I mean, I know people who make that decision. But most people don't, which is why it's a thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, statistics about this don't lie about the, the way in which white people act with their local school based upon how they see it, based upon how many uh, not white people are in it. Which, is, which I find it really strange that the local school district here advertises outside the school with these signs on all the they're like their um, banners 
and they used to, and they show the all the various kinds of people that are students there and it's like you know, you know black faces and hispanic faces and white faces and all sorts of things right you know diversity right mm-hmm. and i'm just sitting there going don't you realize that this is the thing that makes them not want to send their kid here oh my god i mean right yeah i mean that's that's heavy it's very heavy i mean i just it's i mean i want to you know i'm not gonna have any kids but i want to send my kid there but i've made a very specific choice to pay attention to these things and i've been on and i walked around south carolina for for three months advocating for black people yeah i mean I mean, like, in a way that, like, when I would go to, like, I had multiple people, like, purposely take photos with me <laughs> in a situation where that would never have happened. Right. Because, because I was at, like, a debate. And there were a couple of guys who got up and they had wanted a photo with me and they didn't take a photo with any of the other people. Wow. And it was just like, well, holy shit. Right? Yeah. Now, of course, just so you know, everybody know. Just because I did that for three months doesn't mean I'm okay or something. <laughs> Being an ally is horseshit. You just gotta, you know, you gotta actually do the work. Yeah, exactly. So, right. So it's this this world of. I mean, in the end, Dorian, the the people to our right who are considered on the left of um, of the American political spectrum, they're basically centrists. They, they don't care about the things we care about. Yeah. To be honest, I and agree. that doesn't mean and and, but, and I think it's dangerous to treat them with kid gloves. Hmm. Because I think they need to know who their enemies are. And they probably should know that we're their enemies. Hmm. Now I probably shouldn't say it that way. Sure. Sure. But, but here's the deal is that, you know, do you want, do we want Bernie Sanders to drone strike somewhere? Not at all. No. Is he likely to if he became president? Yep. He said so. Yeah. So, you know, so here's the thing is like, we're at this point where it's like, do we go with Bernie Sanders and we try to get more people to, 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 to move everybody slightly more left? Or do we actually like? Or do we actually advocate from the outside? Mm-hmm. I mean, I've done I've done both in a certain sense, but I've mostly done the other, the second thing. And you know, I just I love Bernie, but this isn't worked. Not that the other thing worked either, right? Mm-hmm. The Green Party mm-hmm. isn't going to work. I mean, and I've got I could, that could be a whole different episode, but. <laughs> It's for a lot of, but you know, these are instant, these are structural institutional reasons. And the thing we have to face up is that liberals don't want everyone to have health care. You know why they don't want everyone to have health care? Because health care includes the undocumented. Medicare for all needs to include the undocumented. And it yeah. needs to include literally every person who walks across the border in the United States when they go on vacation. Like, it, like that happens in the South and Central America. When you go onto one of these countries, they, you walk in and they go, here's a health care card for the next 30 days you're here. It's good for the next 30 days. If something happens to you, you can walk into a hospital. That happened when I went to Cuba. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. What happened. But, here, but, but here's the deal, is that people who... Care, who who actually follow Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden and all these people, they want there to be a, a border fence. They want strong, secure borders. How they want to get there is a little bit more humane than the right. They don't want a wall per se, mm-hmm. but they want they want to have a very particular. They want to have immigration reform that's better than what we have now. But they don't want anybody to get health care. They don't want everybody to be able to come into the United States. They don't want everybody to have the availability to do that or the possibility of it. 
I mean, come on. I mean, it's just like, if we think down the logic of liberal positions on everything, we'll realize that the, the point at which they will stop is so much sooner than is humane. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. Right. I mean, like, for example, like, Dorian, we have to live in this world where our options are, well, do we bomb them or do we bomb them? And the, the first bombing is, let's bomb those motherfuckers because we're in charge and we have the power and they're doing something we don't like. Or let's bomb them because, well, I mean, I don't want to bomb them, yeah. but, but we have to. Yeah, it's either, because, it's either... Because we need to maintain our power. It's either let's bomb them or I don't want to have to bomb them, but do it. <laughs> but I will. Yeah, but, but do it. But the, but here's the deal is both of them kill the same number of people. Exactly. Right? And with health care, let's do the public option. Or let's do Medicare for all who want it. You know what that means? No, not everyone will have health care. Exactly. Or like, you know, let's have freedom in this country. Okay, well, what do the Republicans say? Let's have freedom for only certain kinds of people. Definitely not criminals. And uh, let's uh, make sure that we maintain our current hierarchies of power so that means other people don't have freedoms. Like, I don't know, college students can't vote because, well, they, sh- they can, but we don't want them to. Um, so let's make it so college students can't vote. And the Democrats say everyone should be able to vote. Um, uh, but, oh, man, those people voting, that's going to make us look bad. Yeah. Because right? <laughs> I, I remember- if we want everybody to vote, people in prison should be able to vote. Oh, exactly. Absolutely. Even Charles Manson should be able to vote. Guess what? If Charles Manson votes, everybody else will vote different. Don't worry. Charles Manson's vote ain't going to change anything. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Oh, my God. Dude, I mean, um, so it's... Just, just to jump off on that, there was a town hall like uh, right when Donald Trump had become president. Um, it was like uh, just like musicians meetings like it just how is yeah the i remember that community. yeah yeah and i remember there was this this uh person there who something about conservative voters came up and this person was like well i don't think that conservatives should even be allowed to vote they're they're less intelligent i mean they're what? less in- and and all i could think was are you fucking serious like you want to you want to look at somebody's political ideology judge them on their intellect and then take away one of their rights <laughs> yeah you sound like a segregationist yeah exactly um <laughs> so the, the, well that's the yeah. thing is that it really so it, in the end dorian because they don't have their own ideology the one they resort to when things become tough is the, the conservative ideology yeah right i mean it's that so it's when when faced with a difficult decision the answer is authoritarianism right I'm not, I don't feel safe anymore because Donald Trump is in power. Therefore, conservatives should, let me think of a reason for why conservatives shouldn't be able to vote. Right? That's an authoritarian thing. Yeah. Whereas you and I care about democracy. Right? And we care about democracy enough that we'll let fucking Charles Manson vote. (laughs) I mean, like, you know, it's just like, yeah. It's just like, yeah. It's the, well, there's. Dude, the other yeah. uh, the other one, just to throw this in there, um, and this is more against the right wing libertarian folk. Uh, right. Which, by the way, dude, I've been digging into all those Sam Cedar. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Versus those are great libert- they're amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, so just anyway, yeah. Go look up on YouTube, Sam Cedar versus the Libertarians. It's a brilliant uh, series of videos across are, the length of the Majority good. Report. Yeah, they are very good. Um, but, Cedar, S E D E R, everybody. But uh, you know the the argument against um, the the argument that the right wing libertarians use for free speech is always the the well, I I think the worst people should have have the right to free speech like neo Nazis should have have the right to free speech, and I've started to not find the answer on how to argue this yet, but at least started to formulate the way how to address this. <laughs> Uh, which is to find out how libertarian these people actually are, which it's like, all right, so there's a white man, you know, advocating for the free speech rights of a neo-Nazi. 
a neo-Nazi is not an existential threat to a white man. They are to a degree, right. but they're not an immediate existential threat. Um, what is an actual existential threat to to uh, like a, a cisgendered um, man? And and I, I don't have that answer yet, but I'm just slowly realizing that uh, when you when you fight with libertarians, they often live in this like world of this like fantasy fantasy logic land. Uh, yeah. that they don't exist within the real world. And yeah. I'm curious, like, what it, what is something that would actually be be something that they would be fearful? Like, they would be like, oh, my God, this can't exist in the world. Uh, or or if this exists in the world and I come across this, like, I'm fucked. Uh, um, a, uh, a black person arguing that, uh, that Kill Whitey is an actual public policy program. Mm. That would be one. That would be. There are very few people, but there are people that advocate that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Show them that. Ask them about that. Yeah, yeah. And if this uh, individual actually had serious political power. Or like, well, what if what if Lenin was in the United States right now? Mm-hmm. And he wanted to do what he was doing. Would you let Lenin say what he was saying? Right. Like, who, like actually advocating the violent overthrow of the government? To the point that it actually happened, and then they murder an entire class of people. I mean, that's what they did. Yeah. I mean, so, uh, so, in, so let me let me let me sum this up with this yes, thought. Yes. Yes. So, so Dorian, I I don't know how to do this, but this is the thought I'm having: is that so the people on the right have an ideology. The people, leftists, have an ideology. And the people on the right advocate extremely forcefully at all times that their ideology is the right ideology, and anybody else who doesn't share our ideology is full of shit, and that they're right, and you should agree with me, right? And that's what they do. Yes. The people on the left... We gen- there are people who do this, of course, but liberals don't because they really don't have one. They want everybody to live and let live. So my feeling is that the thing to do is to say, hey, everybody, you've got a bullshit ideology and you need to change your ideology and mine's better. Here's why. Yeah. Because in the end, all these milk toast people who basically have an amoral way of looking at the world because of the results of them thinking everything should be left up to taste, right? I mean, that's not what they think exactly, of course, but it's just, it's the result. I mean, the result of supporting Joe Biden is the murdering of people across this planet. I mean, come on. So, I mean, the fact that they want, the the fact that they look at these things and they say, oh, well, but we can, oh, it's not a shame that they did that. It's like that has been trained into people and it's possible to train them out of it because ideology is changeable because we now because you and I don't think what we did 10 years ago. <laughs> you know, dude, uh, this is the last comment um, sure. from me before we get off of here, but it, it's been fascinating watching uh, now that we're at this point in the primaries yeah. Um, people that were very, very, very much fans of me on social media arguing against right wingers. Yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, go like you know, it's like you're betraying us, or you're an idiot, or you're a fool. And it's like, it's like, huh? Like, I'm I'm staying consistent with the stuff I was saying uh, to all the Trump heads. Um. That, that, that y'all were fans of like for the last three years yeah so, well yeah. Dorian yeah um, if Joe Biden becomes president get ready to lose a lot of friends oh yeah oh yeah so all right well and then if Donald <laughs> Trump wins the re-election they'll be even angrier at you yes yes oh my god okay. well, so the, oh. well unless you convince them well Dorian you know the the things, the things that we advocate for have changed people's minds that we know. 
right? I mean, people mm-hmm. that, we, that we know have mm-hmm. have moved farther left because just through experiencing someone saying something different than what happens on liberal media. Yeah, exactly. That that some people will come to our side and some people won't. And it's good to know who will and who won't. True. Because then, the, because then those are the people you can trust on the other side. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, so my name is Dorian Wallace. This is my friend, colleague, composer, performer, David Colma. Uh, and we are Tristeropod. We'll check, we'll check you out next